Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. We're your hosts, Dr. Jessica Steyer and Dr. Andrea Love. And this week, we are talking about something that we get asked about all the time, the world of pet allergies. And we have a very special guest who I'll introduce in just one moment and this unbelievable coincidence <laughs> that, that we'll share in just one sec. But before we do, um, if you haven't already tuned into last week's episode on fiber, definitely check that out. Um, we talked about the importance of fiber um, and we talked about getting fiber through diet versus through supplements, any differences and, and all kinds of good stuff. So go back and check that out if you haven't already. So without further ado, it gives us great pleasure to introduce Dr. Manisha Raylan, who is, well, first let me start with your, with your bio, <laughs> and then we'll get into the other stuff. Um, but Dr. Raylan is a pediatric allergy and immunology specialist that has over 15 years of experience in the medical field. She has extensive experience in environmental allergies and food and drug allergies. She's the creator of Hashtag Allergy Fun Fact Friday, contributor to a baby-led feeding program at 101 Before One, and managing partner of a private practice in central New York. So, you know, just a little bit busy. So um, you can find Dr. Raylan on Instagram at Peds Allergy MD. Manisha, welcome. We are so, so, so happy to have you on the pod. Thank you so much, you guys. Highlight of my week. I've been looking forward to this for so long. We had laryngitis a few weeks ago, so I know I'm excited to finally talk and share. <laughs> All right. Now we have to just give a little bit of like the, the freaky coincidence here, which is that Andrea and I went to college with Manisha's sister and we're <laughs> such good friends with her. I don't know how we didn't put this together. And we literally just figured this out two minutes ago. <laughs> such a small world. And I just, I don't know, our minds exploded and worlds collided and all kinds of good stuff. So yeah. Anyhow, all right. So let's let's set this stage here. So uh, I don't think it's a secret that Andrea and I are major animal lovers. We own a whole lot of pets. So I have four dogs and two cats. And Andrea, you have how many cats? I have seven cats. <laughs> seven cats. Um, Manisha, do you have any pets? I don't. You know, I didn't no. live with any, but I married a man who ha loves animals and grew up with tons of cats and dogs, birds, I think a hamster, maybe a rat, a um, couple of other creatures that have come and gone out of our lives. Love it. I know Love all it. animals. <laughs> so you know all about it. So funny, I grew up um, in a little apartment in South Brooklyn and we had ferrets and guinea pigs and cats and birds and, and iguanas and turtles and it was this little zoo. And Andrea, yeah. I know you, you we had, as well. I had, yeah, we had spiny mice and gerbils and hamsters and guinea pigs. The I hamsters, had yeah. I had two axolotls. Um, I also used to catalog beetles and keep them as pets briefly, cats and dogs, the whole, the whole shebang. So lots of people own pets, right? Um, we know that, let's see, I know we had an estimate in here. Okay, about 38% of U.S. households own a dog and about 25% own a cat. Um, and so obviously we're going to be talking about as much as we love animals, unfortunately, animal allergies are pretty common. So around the world, it's estimated that 10 to 20% of the population has some type of animal allergy. And the most common are allergies to cats and dogs, but people can also have allergies to birds, rabbits, guinea pigs, hamsters, ferrets, and even horses. So, Andrea, do you maybe want to just keep Yeah, let me set the stage. Yep. What is an allergy? <laughs> so allergies are basically inappropriate responses by our immune system. And so allergies in the broad sense are what we call immune system mediated responses. And these basically are occurring to things that normally our body should ignore or treat as benign. And most often, um, so, so if you remember us talking about COVID and vaccination, um, anything that leads to the production of antibodies is called an antigen. So in the context of allergies, um, allergens are specific antibodies that lead to the production of a specific type of an antibody, or sorry, they're 
there are antigens that lead to the production of a specific type of antibody, and these are called IgE antibodies. And so most commonly, allergens, just like antigens, are proteins, or they're glycoproteins, which are proteins that have carbohydrates or sugars attached to them. And typically what happens is most people don't have a response when they encounter them, but in certain instances, um, our immune system will recognize these molecules as foreign, and our B cells will produce these IgE antibodies. The antibodies will then bind with a specific immune cell called a mast cell, and then that IgE that's now sticking out out of that mast cell will bind a new allergen molecule, and it leads to the production of all these inflammatory chemicals. It's called mast degranulation, mast cell degranulation, and it leads to the secretion of histamine, which is probably the most well-known inflammatory chemical, but a lot of other things like certain growth factors and other sorts of cytokines that lead to this very um, immediate and fast inflammatory process. And so maybe, Manisha, you can kind of walk us through the inflammatory process and what some of those symptoms might be when someone's having an allergic reaction. Absolutely. The mast cell is the most important cell, I would say, with an allergic reaction. Basophils are also sometimes involved. And histamine is already kind of preformed. It's already inside the cell. So that's why as soon as the mast cell degranulates or opens, bursts opens and releases the histamine, the reactions are immediate. That's why people know it can be instant within seconds to minutes. And so you can walk into a room and all of a sudden start sneezing. And you don't have to necessarily see the animal or see the trigger, um, but your body has recognized it and it's that fast um, through inhalation, but you can also have it through, um, you can also have other symptoms like runny nose, um, coughing, wheezing, uh, stuffy nose. You can have things like post-nasal drip, which is that mucus generated and that drips down the back of your throat, um, redness of the eyes, watery eyes, sometimes itching of the eyes. And some kids and, um, and adults will also develop things like hives later on. When you start that cascade, you can start to kind of um, set up a response that can even happen hours later. You can kind of have a continuous flow of an allergic reaction. And so you can get like tiredness, you can get irritability, um, you might have difficulty with sleep and that could be also partly due to medications that might be used, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Some of my patients will also talk about itchiness in the in their mouth um, mm-hmm. and uh, the roof of the mouth, the throat, um, especially the throat, I would say, and eyes, ears, nose, throat, mm-hmm. <laughs> all of the head and neck All area. the mucous membranes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, so Manisha, you know, with, when we talk about food allergies, a lot of times Mm -hmm. a common response is that anaphylactic shock Mm -hmm. reaction. Do you see that as often with pet allergies or these tend to be more moderate symptoms? I would say more moderate. I wouldn't say that they're never present. Uh, I do have a couple of patients that are within seconds uh, Mm -hmm. walking in a room and if they have severe asthma, that's a big deal. Um, and so it can kind of manifest as anaphylaxis because you can have two different body systems get involved with the cough, the wheeze, and then also have the rhinitis symptoms from the upper airway involved. And so some cases of severe like asthma exacerbations, we will use epinephrine. And so it can be tricky, um, but I will tell you, mod- in, and that's a rare thing. And in those cases, most of those cases, those people are hooked up with an allergist and hopefully yeah. have a better, you know, plan. I, I- I was actually going to ask, how common is it for there to be a severe allergy to pets? Do you see that a lot or really not often? I, I mean, I'm talking handful of patients, at yeah. least in a private practice setting that I can think of, maybe two or three off the top of my head. So, so that common. should be somewhat reassuring to folks, right? Like right. pet allergies probably not as life-threatening as some of these other kind of allergies like food allergies or medication allergies. Um, but, but a lot of these symptoms are things that people are going to, um, you know, associate with allergic reactions or, you know, a lot of the hay fever symptoms sorts of things, right? Yeah. How are these pet allergies diagnosed? How, how do you go, you know, go through the process to say, okay, you, you definitively have a pet allergy? Yeah. 
Um, we always want to start with uh, the clinical history, right? That's always the most important thing. So you present to me or to a physician with symptoms, and then um, they send you on to allergy testing. There's two ways to test. There's a skin test, and then there's a blood test. And in both cases, we're looking for IgE that Andrew just talked about. So um, with the skin test, it's relatively simple. We use a, a prick method with a little like lancet, and um, you scratch the surface of the skin, the top layer of skin. It's 15 minutes. We look for a wheel and flare, um, which is in English like bubbles and redness. <laughs> um, and so we're just kind of measuring the response and seeing how fast do your mast cells react. And you have a 15 minute window to kind of cause that histamine response. The um, second portion of skin testing, if your allergist decides it's appropriate, which is based on age and history, is the intradermal testing, which is typically in the upper arms. And it's when you take a little needle and you put a little bit of the solution of the allergen um, and you create, you basically create a bubble between the top two layers of skin, the epidermis and the dermal layer, and you're just um, injecting it kind of like a TB test or a PPD test. And then um, again, you wait 15 minutes, you wait to see if there's a response. You're kind of poking the mast cells. I always tell my patients, we have two layers of skin and mast cells reside in both layers, the <laughs> epidermis and the dermal. So we're just poking, we're pricking right. and we're broken. <laughs> and we're seeing, do you have a response? Yes or no. Um, in some cases, it may be difficult to do a scratch test or a poke test. Maybe uh, maybe it's a young child and won't sit still. Maybe there are medications. Maybe there's a history of hives and eczema. It can't stop your antihistamines. Antihistamines, if you're taking them, will block the response to a skin test. So you have to stop your medications to be tested, which is ironic. And some people are very uncomfortable with that. Um, mm -hmm. And so there may be certain situations. There's also certain meds, like psychiatric meds, um, in which case they cannot stop them that have antihistamine effects. Mm. So we'll do a blood test instead. Mm. Okay. So Andrea, what is it? If you have a pet <laughs> allergy, what are you actually allergic to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a misconception that it's like the fur, the hair, but it's actually, as I mentioned, most allergens are proteins, right? So in the same case, it's a protein. Um, and these are proteins that are found in the dander of an animal and that's, you know, dead skin cells, things like that, as well as in the saliva and in the urine. So a lot of places where these proteins can be shed as well. And so these, the dander and mites and all sorts of things, you know, basically can collect on the skin, they can collect in the house, um, you know, in dust or in the air. Um, and ultimately, those are the, the molecules that are eliciting that allergic reaction. So in the context of dogs, the most common allergen is a protein called Canis familiaris 1. Canis familiaris is just domestic dog in Latin. So it's Canis familiaris number one. Um, and that's found in all canines. Um, and then the most common allergies in cats are called FELD1 and FELD4. And again, all cats produce those proteins as well. And as I mentioned, um, these allergies allergens, these proteins can collect on the pets themselves, but, you know, anywhere the pet lives, um, sleeps, um, hangs out in, you know, if a cat runs through the room, it's flinging skin cells everywhere, right? So it can cling to the walls, it can cling to your clothing, um, the floor. And, and of course, these allergens, because they're proteins, they're relatively stable. It's not an actual cell that's surviving. So these can persist in the environment for a period of months, um, and, and even, you know, sometimes, and, and Manisha, I, I know you're going to talk more about like mitigating symptoms, but mm -hmm. cleaning is often very important, but you also have to remember that when you clean, a lot of times you can stir up dust and particles. Mm -hmm. And, and so often if someone is sensitive in the house, you know, when you're cleaning, you want to be, be aware of that as well. Yeah. Can I add a couple of things really yes, quick? Please. I like to, please. I, like to, I translate things in English and I try to simplify it for my patients because I love the science here. And I, I think it's so important, but I always say it's sticky. It's tiny. It's invisible. You can't see it. So even though you don't like, you're like, I only have a cat in the room. What's the big deal? It's like, no, no, no. The allergen is literally in the air floating and waiting to stick to you. And so the more cats you have, the, it's like an exponential increase in the allergen. No, Sorry. It's Andrea, oh my God, your house. Your house. My house is a nightmare for anybody who's allergic. Correct. Yeah. Um, and then I like to also tell them that like, you know, you're not wrong per se that like, it's not in the fur, but like cats lick 
you know, yes. and like our dogs lick themselves or whatever. And so, yes, the allergen can transfer to the fur, but it's not the origination. And that that is why like that length of hair of an animal does not matter. So right. you get short haired or you get long haired. I hear this all the time. Oh, my dog's short haired. I'm like, I don't care. It it's, it's produced the skin that's produced at the level of it. And, you know, so like it doesn't matter as long as they have skin, they're making their dander and they're making, you know, the allergen. So I was like to point that out. <laughs> That is a great point and a perfect yep. segue into the thing we hear all the time. Oh, I got a hypoallergenic pet, mm. so my allergies or my kids' allergies won't be bad. So maybe, Jess, you can set the stage because this is a yeah. big industry. No, it's yeah, allergy-free animals. This is a booming industry. It's very lucrative. People pay thousands upon thousands of dollars for animals from breeders who claim that, you know, oh, the pets that we're breeding, they, they won't cause, they won't trigger allergies, right? Um, and I think we all know, you know, President Obama, he was, he also got on board with the trend. I think there was a lot of publicity around um, his family getting a Portuguese water dog, right? Because um, his daughter had allergies. So is there such a thing I'm asking you both as a truly hypoallergenic cat or dog. Is it worth the money? Mm -mm. It's a unanimous no. <laughs> unanimous no. <laughs> Save your money. Is that the verdict? I mean, is there any difference? Is there any truth to it? So I'm so, going to let Manisha maybe start and then I'll jump yeah. in with some more data. Yeah. I was going to say, I want to tell you my saying. My saying is hypo means low. It doesn't mean negative. It doesn't mean no. It just means that this species or this breed make may produce less allergen compared to a different breed, but that's actually not even true. <laughs> They've done studies and I'm sure Andrea can jump in and share some of those studies, but um, hypo just means low and you're just paying money to just say something might be lower and there's no guarantee. There's also differences sometimes in, um, in male and female um, animals and sometimes there's differences in the same litter. You could literally mm -hmm. have one that produces more than another. Well, and so, Andrew, I know you're going to get into this more, but it's interesting because even the American Kennel Club on their website, they have a list of dog breeds that are hypoallergenic, right? And who's uh, what's listed there? The Bichon Frise, Chinese Crested, Bedlington Terrier, Kerry Blue Terrier, Maltese Poodle, Portuguese Water Dog, Irish Water Spaniel, Schnauzer, and Wheaton Terrier. And then the cats that supposedly produce less dander are the Cornish Rex, Russian Blue, Bengal, Sphinx, Oriental Shorthair, Siberian, Devon Rex. Am I saying that right, Andrea? Or Balinese? Yeah. Um, all right, Andrea, so, I know I mean, you have more to say. Yeah. Some of those are naked pets, right? Like the Chinese Crested is like this really sad looking, and I'm, apologies no. for anybody that has one, but it's naked and it has this sad little like beard and little scraggly. And the same with like your Devon Rex and your, or no, sorry, the Cornish Rex and the Sphinx Cat and things like that. They're, they're naked, right? But as Manisha said, if you, if you have skin, you know, you're, you're making dander, right? And so... I think it's also important to remember that like the AKC is making money off of selling and, and certifying these, these purebred animals. And I have to say my seven mutts of cats are Same. pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, I have only mutts. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know anything about like, breeds. They're like, what breed are they? I'm like, I don't know. Dumpster cat. Um, exactly. Street rat. That's all yeah. I'm <laughs> Trash baby. Um, yep. so, but if you actually, actually look at the data, they're, they're, there have been studies that are investigating this. And so, you know, I, I pulled a couple of studies, but a lot of the data are pretty, pretty similar. So there was a, a 2011 study where they wanted to look at whether or not, you know, these dog, dog breeds that are classified by the AKC, you know, actually have lower dog allergen levels. So Canis familiaris one, that's that that protein or the the primary allergenic allergenic protein, um, and they looked at you know the dogs versus um, the homes and things like that, and so they basically found um, they looked at dust samples from carpets and floors, um, and they looked at. Um, um, 60 different dog breeds that were in the study, 11, which fell under the, 
hypoallergenic classification, and they found that there were no differences in the level of allergens sourced from the homes of these pets. Um, and of course, they obviously reported some limitations that in this particular study, um, they didn't actually catalog how long each dog was in the room of interest and, and so on and so forth. Um, but there was a bigger study that was conducted by the University of Utrecht, and they published this in Journal of Allergy and Clim Clinical Immunology um, back in 2012, and they looked at the levels of Canis familiaris 1 protein um, in hair and coat samples of dogs, as well as in the environment, so dust and airborne samples. And they sourced hundreds of samples for this study. They had six main groups of dogs. So they had purebreds for Labradoodles, which are those crossbreeds with the Labrador and the Poodle, um, Labrador Retrievers, which are non-hypoallergenic, Poodles, hypoallergenic, Spanish Water Dogs, hypoallergenic, Airedale Terriers, I, I'm, I'm tired of making And then they had a control mixed breed, like mutt group that had a hundred and some dogs with 47 different breeds represented there too, as well. They also collected survey data from owners of pets to get information about self-reported allergy symptoms. And so what they did was they collected hair and coat samples, and these are kind of different. So the hair samples, they actually clipped the fur and they took the fur directly. The coat samples, they actually vacuumed the dogs to get like the fluff and the dust and the undercoat and the dander samples. And then they also collected what they called settled floor dust and then settled airborne dust. So they're collecting all sorts of different samples throughout the home and from the dogs themselves. And what they found was that the ones listed as hypoallergenic actually had higher levels of the Canis familiaris 1 protein in their coats and in mm. their hair um, compared to the non-hypoallergenic dogs. Um, and then when they looked at the environmental um, impact, they actually found comparable levels across the board. So what mm -hmm. it suggests is that, first of all, there doesn't seem to be a difference in the home in terms of what dander and allergens are being shed, regardless of the breed. But interestingly, the hypoallergenic ones, at least in the instances sampled, they actually produce a little bit more of the allergen. So maybe the coarseness of their fur is trapping, or maybe there were more female versus male dogs. I mean, there's a lot of genetic variability amongst these dogs, even if they're purebred. So, but the big takeaway here is that there's really no difference in allergenicity. You know, there's no difference in kind of what's being found in the home, um, what's being kind of shed by the dog, and in theory, what's, you know, being, what's hanging out on their fur after they're grooming themselves. So, so in- in reality, yeah, there's really nothing, no difference in kind of these allergen production levels. So don't spend thousands of dollars from a breeder. Go to your local dog rescue or, you know, cat rescue and, and rescue. Um, all right. I have a bunch of, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, Manisha. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sorry, sorry, guys. I wonder if um, if when you have a hypoallergenic dog, you're also less likely to wash it uh, and like oh. make it. And because, like the longer hair dogs, you're like more likely to clean up after. And so therefore you're not washing the dander off. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out was like, yeah, we're only looking at one allergen, but you know, as humans, we have tons of different proteins and so do animals. Like we are only looking at one, but like can F one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think is out there. And Feldy one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I, and more maybe out there by now. So we're just looking at one isolated protein that we know is found in their dander, their urine, their saliva. But what about prostate gland that comes up in, in the male. And so when they pee, it's not like they can select, right? Not to, not to secrete their prostate gland secretions into their urine. So it's, a, it's more complicated than it appears right. and then people tend to simplify when it comes to marketing and it's always about money at the end of the day they cost yeah. more and so you have to say why is not is it worth it right mm -hmm. spoiler great, alert no yeah great yeah. <laughs> great point and and actually you know those are some of the limitations right you know and and you know, when you're doing studies and you're taking survey data from the owners, you know, maybe they're recalling they clean more frequently than they do or, you know, so so there are variability. But I think, you right. know, overall, the, the clinical and kind of the real world data suggests that there's really no difference in the amount of allergen that is produced by dogs, mm -hmm. regardless of what breed. Ultimately, if right. they have skin, even if they're naked dogs or naked cats, mm -hmm. they're going to produce <laughs> these allergens. <laughs> so, so Manisha, let's say you are a person who suffers from pet allergies, but you love animals. 
how do you treat, you know, what, what, is, what does the treatment look like for this? And can you live with pets if you do have a pet allergy? You guys, my favorite thing to sell people is like, listen, you love your animals. Who do you think you're more likely to get rid of? Your allergist or your animal? And like, you meet me once, you meet me twice, you're going to be like, bye. I don't <laughs> like what you have to say. So of course, the most important thing you can do is to try to remove the animal. If your child or yourself, if you're suffering from symptoms. So I want to backtrack and really th quickly throw in this important point too. A positive test does not mean you have an allergy by itself. You have to have symptoms with a positive test to define an allergy. So I don't want you guys like randomly calling your doctor saying, hey, I want to be tested just in case. No, it doesn't work like that. You have to have symptoms around the allergen and and then the test kind of clarifies or confirms it, I guess is the best way to say it. So if you have a confirmed allergy to an animal and you're symptomatic around the animal, the first thing we're going to suggest is to, can you remove the animal from your home? Is this something that you love? Is it part of your family? If that's not an option, that's okay. We're going to discuss the ways to treat it. And I'll tell you, 99% of the time, people are like, no, that's not an option. And I'm like, that's fine. Just don't get rid of me because I still got more stuff to say. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't goodbye. <laughs> but I, I do occasionally get a family um, that will be like, no, no, uh, this was a new animal to us. We weren't sure. Now that we see she's symptomatic. Um, it just happened to me a couple of weeks ago, actually, where our family decided to get rid of the cat because the cat was triggering asthma in the child. And so the patient came back and her um, spirometry was normal and she was medicine free. And it was a, it was a hard decision. Everybody cried in the room. Even I got teary eyed. Um, Cause you don't want, you know, it's not an easy decision to make, but if that's okay with your family and you're okay with that, that's the first recommendation is to remove the animal, reduce the number of animals present in general. So if you have seven cats, Andrea, <laughs> go into one. <laughs> um, and if that's not, not, happening. An option, <laughs> not an option, great. We keep going down the list. We got more stuff. Um, environmental modifications, first and foremost. So where do we spend the most amount of time in our room, in our house? What room? Uh, uh, bedroom? Either living room or bedroom, I would say. Exactly. I mean, I'm a pediatric allergist. Yes, I, I focus mostly on kids, but um, but looking at adults and kids, and I know we were going to hopefully reach this point, but it doesn't matter, right? Like if you're, you're mostly going to need to sleep at least six to eight hours, and that's at least a quarter to a third of your day. And so you want to hit the bedroom as a priority and then the living space where you and the animal will spend the most amount of time. And so certain measures that we know are effective are things like carpets, um, removing them or at least vacuuming them regularly. Removal is preferred just because the dust can really settle deep inside of the grains of the carpet. Um, if you're going to vacuum, it might be a good idea to wear a face mask um, or ventilate the room. Um, HEPA filters, air filters are really helpful. Uh, things like um, changing your clothes. So I talk about this often, but keeping the animal out of your bedroom and then after a bath or shower, changing into new clothes and then not touching the animal again. So you're not taking the dander with you to bed mm -hmm. basically is a concept. Um, and so those are, I would say, the biggest so Sorry. not letting all seven sleep on top of your face at night, Probably I guess. Probably not. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cute. So I have to tell you, I do have patients that come in and tell me, we love our animals. They're going to be in our bed and environmental modifications are just not possible. Great. The next step is medications. Um, and uh, Andrea, we can run through the pharmacotherapy together. Yeah. Uh, and the last step will be immunotherapy and we'll talk yeah. about that too. Awesome. So I'll kind of kick it off. So there's a few different broad classes and I'm going to have Manisha kind of dig into them, but antihistamines, as you would expect, they're trying to reverse the impact or the effect of histamines. They're trying to reduce levels of histamine, which often are the key mediators, a lot of those symptoms, the runny nose, the inflammation, the, the itchiness, things like that. So there are prescription and over-the-counter antihistamine options. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, and then you have corticosteroids, which are, um, steroids basically target the immune system. They try to reduce kind of systemic inflammation. So again, they're trying to moderate those symptoms that are elicited by that mast cell reaction. Um, and again, there are prescription, I think there's a couple of over-the-counters as well. Mm -hmm. there are um, 
And then there are decongestants, again, prescription and over the counter. We'll talk a little bit about like some that have data and some that don't, but the goal of decongestants are to, to constrict the, um, the vasculature, so the blood vessels in the respiratory tract and help kind of shrink some of the swelling that leads to the feeling of, of being stuffy. Um, and then there's another class of medications called leukotriene inhibitors. And basically what they do is they block the production of a chemical called leukotriene, which are, again, produced by the immune system. And they create a lot of that, um, the, the respiratory symptoms, the bronchoconstriction, a lot of the inflammation, and also mucus secretion, which, especially with those who have asthma, again, can exacerbate the allergic response to pets. So, um, Manisha, maybe you can talk a little bit about, like, what yeah. you typically lead with and, and what, you know, um, what options there are for over the counter and also maybe prescriptions. Yeah, absolutely. I like to break it down and tell people medications are band-aids. So we're going to treat your symptoms. So you have to tell me, what are you most bothered by? And so if your biggest complaints are itchiness and runniness, that's antihistamines. And there are um, oral antihistamines, so by mouth, there's nasal antihistamines, which are nose sprays, and there's ocular antihistamines, which are basically eye drops. And so you're targeting what your biggest issues are. Sometimes you'll need a combination. Sometimes you'll need all three. Um, and so my preferred is always treat the problem where the problem is. And my patients know I say this all the time to them. I'm always more about proactive instead of reactive. And so um, the the nasal antihistamines is my preferred route. But listen, we all have kids, at least I have kids. And most of my patients that are coming in are pediatric. So all the parents are like, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and there's no way that we're getting nose sprays in their nose like every night. So we can sometimes coordinate depending on the person in front of us. And there are adults that don't like nasal sprays either. My biggest pet peeve, and you probably saw this on a fun fact, was the technique. It is so important. That. <laughs> it is so important to know how to spray your nose. If you are unsure, please come check out my post or please check the package insert. Please look up videos because it's all about technique. Don't if you spray don't it share directly it. up. Yeah, we'll reshare yeah, it. We'll definitely reshare it. This mm -hmm. is just my biggest pet peeve. You will not believe how many people come to see me and like, we're tried all the meds. It's not working. No, nasal corticosteroids are first line treatment for allergies. And so um, if your congestion is a big issue, if eye symptoms are a big issue, or if, if you check off every single symptom, I'm going to start with the nasal corticosteroid first because it is first line. And so nasal, again, that means you, that's a nose spray. And that's basically your famous um, Flonase, nasal cord, rhinocord. There's new things called Flonase Sensimist uh, that's out there. There's Q-nasal, which is one of my favorites um, because there's no drip and it's a uh, prescription only. And it's basically when you spray it, it shoots out like a mist, like an inhaler, but it's for your nose. And so it's like kind of dummy proof, if you will. Um, but it comes out really fast. Some of the kids really like it. The adults really like it. Um, the, the goal is to get the medicine in your nose and to do it correctly. Yeah. So um, nasal sprays, antihistamines, as I kind of mentioned, um, are also over the counter. The oral are the Zyrtex, the Claritins, the Allegra, Zizols. And then there's some um, enantiomers of them. So like uh, desloratadine is like the enantiomer of loratadine. Mm -hmm. And um, there's cetirizine, which is Zyrtec, and the enantiomer is Zizol, which is levocetirizine. And Andrea, I don't know if you've touched upon enantiomers before, if you want to... Not not hugely, but basically they're they're structural, essentially mirrors. So they're they're very similar in the same active ingredient, but they have slight structural differences that change the chemical properties a little bit. And so a lot of medications within a given class are often enantiomers of each other because they have similar properties. Sometimes they're better tolerated than some individuals um, because everybody has slightly different enzymes to process these. So you're always considering how bioavailable are they, right? You know, every every person is going to respond a little bit differently to different medications. Yeah. I have a question I about it. Oh, oh mm -hmm. I wanted to note really quickly because I know that this has gotten a lot of attention recently, but Benadryl is no longer considered first line of defense for allergic reactions of any kind because mm -hmm. it's a first generation antihistamine and first generation antihistamines cross the blood brain barrier. And that leads to more of those undesired side effects like grogginess and lethargy. Um, and whereas these newer ones like our Claritin and Allegra and Zyrtec um, are second line antihistamines or second, second generation antihistamines, and they don't have those, um, those um, side effects associated with them, the grogginess and the drowsiness. 
Yes. So Manisha, I know you we're going to talk about, I think you said uh, immunotherapies as, as another option. I just had a question for you. You know, what if someone, they, they have pet allergies, but they love their pets and they're taking these things on a long-term basis. Is there any danger or downside to taking these meds, you know, every day, long-term? I mean, everything has side effects. I always like to preface that because that's, that's a true statement. There are, you know, even though the second generation antihistamines are not supposed to cause drowsiness, there is a small number of patients that will come and say, hey, no, the cetirizine makes me tired. I've even had people come and tell me Allegra makes them tired. And I'm like, what? Is that supposed to cross your blood brain barrier? Are you sure? And, you know, it's hard to tease apart sometimes. Is it your allergies and your allergic reaction? Is it the medication? Is it the combination? Um, who knows? But everything has side effects. And for long term, Jess, we really worry about the nasal corticosteroids. I would say corticosteroids have the worst profile um, just because they are a steroid. They do affect every single cell of the membrane and, you, and um, you can get thinning, you can have eye disease as a long-term thing. The absorption is not as strong as if you were to take oral corticosteroids, which by the way, your allergist may prescribe if you are that miserable and if you've maxed out on your medications. And I just wanted to tell you guys, there are combination nasal sprays out there. I just feel that like patients don't know that, but there are actually nasal sprays where they combine the nasal antihistamine and nasal corticosteroid together. And that's kind of cool. Um, but basically we always want to try to minimize meds when we can, when, and if we can, and if we cannot, then yeah, of course um, we take the meds. But for the other part of this is that I would be remiss not to say there are some, you know, herbal things that people talk about a lot. There are some molecules out there that maybe there's some evidence behind using a little bit of quercetin or using a little, little bit of, um, just common sense things like nasal salines, you know, mm. just rinsing out the flushing of the membranes um, and washing the allergen or decreasing the allergic allergen load to mm. your body. Um, then that might be helpful. Showering, like we talked about earlier, as a part of environmental modification decreases your load. And one of the things we didn't talk, talk about as much, but these allergens are everywhere. Even if I don't have an animal in my home, you come and check the dust out of my house. My kids may have tracked it in from daycare, from school, from the library, from the buses, the trains, like any public area, these allergens are sticky and we'll just bring them back on our clothing and bring them back to our house. So um, it is important to minimize our risk and the best most effective therapy, not a cure, but most effective therapy is immunotherapy. Yeah. Yeah. So immunotherapy, and I'm going to have Manisha kind of talk about, you know, the administration of it, but basically what you're doing is you're training your immune system or you're, you're um, you know, basically moderating the response. And so it works by introducing small levels of the allergen in question, not enough to trigger a full on allergy mm -hmm. attack or an allergic response, but enough for the body to be like, hey, this doesn't belong here. And it starts to develop an antibody response and an immune response to it. And eventually you're going to elicit a memory immune response. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to do this periodically over a course of time where you, you give small micro doses of the allergen so that mm -hmm. your immune system generates tolerance to it. So that mm -hmm. eventually when you're exposed to it in real life, you go back to saying, hey, this is benign. I don't need to have this crazy mast cell histamine reaction. This thing is not going to harm me. And it's funny because when we debunked homeopathy, a lot of people are like, well, isn't that like immunotherapy? And it's very different because homeopathy, you're diluting something to, to the point where there's nothing, no active ingredient in it. And people are believing that it's something active. Here, you're actually giving someone a tangible, measurable dose of an active ingredient that actually is communicating with the immune system. So maybe Manisha, you can, and, and this is obviously called allergy shots, right? People call these allergy shots and this is your allergy immunotherapy. Yeah. It's my favorite, most amazing thing. It's one of the main reasons I became an allergist because how cool is it to treat your allergies? It's like the most precision, most individualized plan I can create. And in, at least in my practice, we create bottle vial sets and we create them specifically for you. So based off of your skin test, your blood test, um, we mix and I call it mixing potion because <laughs> it's kind of an art to it. There's like ranges and you can select how much of the antigen um, you put in the vials. And 
and then you titrate. You basically start at this diluted. Um, most people do four vial sets or five vial sets. They dilute the allergen. So you start with one to one. You make it in in house. Uh, most allergists will make their own um, mixes. And then you dilute one to 10, one to 100, one to 1,000, one to 10,000. Most people will start at either one to 1,000 or one to 10,000, depending on the severity and depending on you. And with kids, sometimes I start lower. With adults, if I have consent, I'll start a little bit faster. It just depends. But basically, there's a whole buildup phase. And the buildup phase is going through this very tightly controlled dilution and volumes. Um, so basically you start at 0.05 mLs of the lowest dilution, and then you work your way weekly or twice a week. Um, there is such a thing as cluster immunotherapy where you can do it in like a very short amount of time, like a couple of weeks or even a week. But uh, that's another conversation for another day. And, um, and you basically speed up through this process and you're basically training your immune system to, to handle higher and higher and higher and higher doses of the allergen without response. In the beginning, you will always create an IgE response because there is allergen inside the vials. But the point is to eventually activate the Tregs and to eventually activate and the regulatory response and then to get energy, which is like basically nothing. And so um, the goal of immunotherapy, once you reach through one-to-one -one and you reach the top dose of your one-to-one -one vial, you, you hit maintenance and then you do maintenance for three to five years. Um, and it's basically every four weeks you come in and we just remind your body, hey, remember the stuff you were allergic to? Hey, remember the stuff you're allergic to? Don't make a response. <laughs> and so you're kind of just trying to train the body so that when we stop, your body still remembers not to make a response. So is this a cure for an allergy? No. No. Um, we, don't, we can't say that it is because it's not 100%. Every person... We're not, we're, we can't fit into one box. <laughs> we can't fit into one size shape, like fits all. Because even during the immunotherapy response, you're supposed to check in with your allergist regularly every six to 12 months. And I check in and I say, hey, how was Bragby season? Hey, how were your reactions to cat? Hey, what's going on when you're around the dogs? If you're still having issues, I'll take the vial. I'll look at the prescription and I'll say, let me up the dose. Let me try to maximize this for you. Sometimes I break the rules. Sometimes I don't even reach the top dose and I can't make it. So it's not a cure, but it's pretty effective. Um, somewhere between 80 to 90%. Um, and that's pretty, wow. about as good as we can get. <laughs> yeah. And the yeah. younger you are, the better it is to, 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 to kind of, what I say, manipulate your immune system. Um, because puberty is pretty big and, you know, adults, we've been through a lot. And so it's a lot harder, but it's like, right. if, the younger you are, you can even theoretically prevent eczema. Theoretically, if your um, pet allergy is triggering eczema, it can kind of decrease those flares for mm -hmm. you as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, the immune system is pretty amazing, but it's also pretty complex and it's, it varies from person to person. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, immunotherapy is really, it's, it's one of the most interesting aspects, I think for sure. Yeah. Well, Manisha, I feel like we could speak for hours about this. Um, are is there any like takeaways or any last thoughts that you want the listeners to to hear? I think that um, if you love your animals, love them. It's fine. Just find an allergist that will meet you where you are, and don't give up on that. Don't just like kind of put us all in a box and say, "Oh, my doctor," blah blah blah. There's always someone out there that will tell you what you want to hear. And then there's always someone out there that will tell you the truth. And you kind of need to find someone <laughs> that will tell you the truth, but also meet you where you are. And I think that's really where we should be. Um, and we're not trying to sell you anything. I always tell people, if you can't commit to my stuff, to the immunotherapy, don't do it. Like, I'm not trying to sell you this. I'm just trying to give you all your options. And it should be informed decision, informed consent. So the best pet is always going to be a pet rock, you guys. But we can't do that. <laughs> we do not agree. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea and I, no, at that one point, we're going to push back on Manisha. Um, I, think I, I think I have a pet. I do. Hang on. I have a pet. I have a oh, pet Andrea. rock. There you go. There you go. My daughter just paint. We have rocks all over the house. My kids collect rocks and paint them. But yeah, we also have four, four dogs and two cats. Anyway, Andrea, do you yes. want to wrap things up? I will. I will. Well, Manisha, thank you so much for joining us, providing all of your clinical expertise and insight. I hope people realize that if you have a hypoallergenic dog because you thought you thought it was 
great. Love that pet. Treat that pet wonderfully. But don't be fooled by the industry and thinking that it's a uh, reality because, again, all animals make allergens. Um, so you can't there. – there is no such thing as an allergy-free pet. Um I hope our listeners learned a thing or two. Thanks for tuning in. Um, and if you want more unbiased science, please check out our sub stack for $5 a month. You're supporting our efforts and it gives you access to our private Facebook group and monthly Q and A. So you can find that at the And we're recording video. So please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com at unbiasedscipod. Um, and make sure to follow Dr. Manisha Raylon at... I'm going to go back to it. It's Peds Allergy MD and also the contributor of uh, at 101 Before One. So that's one of her um, her efforts that she's involved with as well. We will, of course, continue to provide tons of other science and health related content on our social media accounts. So be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter at Unbiased Sci Pod. Catch you next time on the pod, your trusted source for no nonsense, just science.